the presenting health professional has made every attempt to protect the privacy of patients whose cases are discussed, and we ask that you respect that privacy. Welcome everybody to Lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds, co-sponsored by Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute and IHA in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and tonight we will be discussing a case of elevated cholesterol level despite plant predominant diet to treat or not to treat. Uh, here's our agenda. Uh, we're gonna spend a few minutes introduce introducing everybody uh, because we have a, a really big topic and some great panelists. I have a feeling we're gonna go a little over. So uh, that's uh, probably gonna take us to about, oops, that should say 8.30. No, yeah, 8.25, that's right. And um, we're gonna officially end at 8.30. Uh, and if you have to leave, that's fine. You will qualify for the free CME that we will send to everybody. You will receive a, a little email at the end of uh, this and uh, just fill out the survey, uh, the, the required questions, and then we'll send you back a certificate for one hour of CME. If you'd like to uh, partner with RLMI to empower your patients, uh, please reach out to beth.garber at rocklifemed.org. We run three different facilitated programs which are available to um, clinicians all over the world. We have about 200 doctors now who do refer us patients. If you go to our website, it's very simple to click on a link to a referral form. You just put in minimal information about the patient and we will then contact the patient for you. So, and they can sign up for one of our three ACLM certified programs, the 15 day whole food plant-based jumpstart, the lift project or PIVIO. Thanks to a generous donation, all of the CME uh, that we offer is free uh, to qualified medical professionals. And that includes a, a one online course, which is uh, uh, you can get up to 24 CMEs. Uh, now, what's unique about two of our programs is that you can actually participate live with patients. So the jumpstarting, uh, the jumpstarting your health up program. If you go through the jumpstart with patients, you'll get ten CMEs, and the same thing is true if you go through the lift project with ten, with 10 CMEs. And privacy terms: uh, we ask that you not try to figure out who the patient is, and uh, make sure that we are respectful of any uh, uh, privacy issues. Uh, having seen this case, I doubt very much where anybody could figure out who the person is. So I'm not too worried. Thank you, Dr. Clapper. Uh, and uh, speaking of Dr. Clapper, so we have a, an exciting lineup of uh, stars tonight. Dr. Clapper will be, will be presenting the case uh, of the uh, vegan with uh, uh, elevated cholesterol. He's a gifted clinician, internationally recognized teacher, and sought after speaker on diet and health, and has practiced medicine for more than 40 years. Dr. Clapper graduated from the University of Illinois in 1972 did a medical internship and received training in surgery, anesthesiology and orthopedics in British Columbia and trained in obstetrics at the University of California hospitals. He then practiced acute care medicine in New Zealand and served on the staff of True North uh, in California, where, which specializes in therapeutic fasting and health improvement through a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, Dr. Clapper teaches that health comes from healthy living. He served as an advisor to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Project on Nutrition, was a member of the Nutrition Task Force of the American Medical Student Association, and served as the director of the nonprofit Institute of Nutrition Education and Research. Dr. Clapper contributed to the making of Food for Thought and the award-winning Diet for a New America movie. He's been featured in What the Health and Cowspiracy. He feels the most important work of his career is the, in the moving forward Moving, moving Medicine Forward initiative, wherein he travels to the nation's medical schools to educate students on using plant-predominant nutrition and positive lifestyle changes to truly heal their patients. On a personal note, uh, my wife and I did perform an experiment on our children in 1991. We became vegan, uh, and uh, we used uh, Dr. Clapper's uh, books to help us through that, and some, some of his writings. And speaking of help that we got raising our kids, Dr. John McDougall also gave us confidence to raise our children when we made our switch back in 1991, because both Dr. McDougall and Dr. Clapper have been doing this for a really, really long time. And uh, uh, as you, many of you may have heard of Dr. McDougall, he's a board certified internist and author of 13 national best-selling books and the Inter International Online McDougall Newsletter. He's a practicing physician who supervises all teaching and medical activities at the highly successful 12-day telemedicine, teleeducation McDougall program. Dr. Uh, McDougall is our guest panelist tonight. Dr. Uh, Robert Brakey is one of our regular panelists, uh, board certified in family medicine and lifestyle medicine. Uh, he has been a family physician in Ann Arbor, Michigan for 36 years and serves as the medical director for IHA's William J. Folletti Center for Lifestyle Medicine, as well as the chair of IHA's governing board. He's also on the board of directors for two national organizations, Plant-Based Nutrition Support Group and PPOD. 
He has a special interest in employing lifestyle medicine approaches for disease reversal. Uh, so, uh, another guest panelist tonight is actually Dr. Brian Asbill, who graduated cum laude from Davidson College in 1990 with a BS in biology and received his MD degree from the Medical University of South Carolina. Oh, I didn't know you were the valedictorian. Okay, now I'm intimidated in 1994. Dr. Asbill completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at the University of Virginia. He completed his cardiology fellowship training at, um, not even sure what that stands for, uh, in 2001, he'll fill me in on that one, and subsequently joined Asheville Cardiology, where he served as an invasive non-interventional cardiologist until 2020. He additionally completed board certification in clinical lipidology in 2008, received a certificate in plant-based nutrition from eCornell in 2013, and completed board certification in lifestyle medicine in 2017. Dr. Asbel serves as the medical director of the cardiac rehab program for Mission Health, chief lifestyle medicine officer for C2 Life, and chief health officer for Love That Life. Uh, so very excited to have um, Dr. Asbel as well, and then Dr. Friedman and I, myself. We will we're, we're regulars. Dr. Friedman is our course wrangler, and I'm going to skip over hers as I will skip over mine, so we can get down to the case. And here is the case: elevated cholesterol level despite plant predominant diets to treat or not to treat. Dr. Clapper, please share your screen. Well, uh, as well, thank you very much, uh, Ted, for the introduction. Uh, thank all the attendees for uh, being here and giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, share uh, thoughts on this very interesting topic. Uh, as you've heard, I've been a physician in the plant-based world for over 40 years and have helped many people adopt a whole food plant-based diet, and I've witnessed many wonderful recoveries of health and reversals of disease. Uh, but now as the decades have gone by, it seems that every month I get a call, a text, an email from someone who has been plant-based for 20 years, a long time uh, plant-based eater. As a doc, I just had an insurance physical and the blood test came back and my cholesterol is 224. Uh, my uh, uh, my LDL is up, my family doctor is very upset and wants me to go on statins right away. What should I do? And variations of this theme keep coming up uh, again and again in my inbox here. So I would like to share uh, my clinical case, which is a composite of all these people that I've been uh, having to correspond with the last uh, uh, the last uh, several years. So this is a healthy 52-year-old woman, slender, athletic body. She's a runner. Uh, and her diet has been completely plant-based for the last 14 years. She has no family history of coronary artery disease. She denies chest pain, or no palpitations. She goes out for 5K training runs on a regular basis, never does shortness of breath, no signs of, of uh, artery compromise or coronary artery disease. Uh, but her latest uh, cholesterol came back at 218 uh, milligrams per deciliter with an LDL of 164. Doctor says she needs to start on statins right away. So the question is, will she gain significant benefit from starting statin therapy? And is there any risk or downsides from her taking the statins? Um, that's the overarching question here. And uh, with that, it would be appropriate to, I guess, go on to our first poll question. Do you agree or disagree, given that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of Americans today, and the vast majority of them seem to have elevated cholesterol level, as many cardiologists would say, all people with a, if your cholesterol is over 200 milligrams or your LDL is over 150, you should be on statins to prevent atherosclerotic plaque formation. Do you strongly agree with this? Do you somewhat agree with this? Do you somewhat disagree with this? Or do you strongly disagree with this? Okay. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. McDougall. How do you? What is your thought on this, and how do you react to the way the audience answered? Well, I, I strongly. Well, the audience. Uh, well, I'm glad they they fell on the side that I voted on. Okay. And that is that uh, I strongly disagree. This woman should not be on statins. Uh, as I read it, she's uh, her indication would be primary prevention. And uh, the reason I sent you those articles is because there are three of the most recent articles that discourage clinicians from uh, using statins as they did indiscriminately, mm -hmm. particularly against people who have uh, a primary indication rather than a secondary indication. You know, no question about it, uh, <clears throat> statins lower cholesterol. 
uh, bempedoic acid, which is a new one, which cost about $500 a month, lowers cholesterol also about 30 to 50 points. We have the PCSK9 inhibitors. They lower cholesterol, uh, you know, maybe 50 points. Mm -hmm. uh, and also there's a herb out there that does as well as far as lowering cholesterol as any of the things I mentioned, and that's berberine. Mm -hmm. The thing about all these drugs is none of them, well, except for statins, show a significant reduction in overall mortality. They definitely lower cholesterol, but the problem is not cholesterol. The problem is the food. This patient doesn't suffer from statin deficiency or bimpedoic acid or PCSK9 deficiency. That's not the problem. You know, as a doctor or, you know, if you're in the health food business, there are many ways you can lower cholesterol. You give goo lipid, charcoal, garlic, you know, all kinds of ways to lower the numbers. But, you know, dying with a low cholesterol is nothing to brag about. And no physician should brag about their patient dying with a low cholesterol. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the papers that I sent you, what they show is in terms of primary prevention, which is not indicated anymore for statin therapy, uh, it pretty consistently recommend against prescribing it for somebody like this lady, which is for primary prevention. <clears throat> Secondary prevention, the benefits are just a few days, you know, from spending all that money, taking all that time, all that belief. You're talking about just a few days of, of benefits and survival. So, you know, I, I sent you three of the more recent research papers that I've run across that substantiate that. As far as uh, benpedoic acid, which is a new one to me, it's you know, since I was in, in the practice of medicine, you know, that's getting a lot of attention, but no overall reduction in mortality. And that's really what counts. You mm -hmm. know, patients don't really care how low their cholesterol is. They just want to live, they want to live well and long, you know, have a good life and they don't want to die. And none mm -hmm. of these drugs has been shown to do that significantly, except you might be arguing that statins do in really sick people. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, not much. You know, nothing I really brag about. So, you know, clearly I believe this patient should be treated with dietary therapy because the problem is she's suffering from food poisoning as a consequence of the rich Western diet. At most, she's suffering from food poisoning. Oh, no, she's actually changed her diet, hasn't she already? So she's on a plant based diet. Of course, we don't know. It's we told she's on a plant based diet. We don't know whether yeah, we don't it's know what that means. Means. style or junk, junk food vegan, but um, we'll hear more about that later. Well, thank you for that, Dr. McDougall. Uh, we have Dr. Ryan Asbill, who's a cardiologist and lipidologist. Uh, Dr. Asbill, what do you think? I also strongly disagree. I, th I think that the key word here in this sentence for me is the first word, all. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no sense to treat all people with one sort of treatment strategy. Uh, certainly primary prevention here. I think that I would want to know more. I would want to know what the patient's inflammatory markers look like. I would want to know whether or not she has asymptomatic vascular disease. Um, so I strongly disagree uh, based on the way that the question is written. I, I, just to, to sort of segue off Dr. McDougall's comments on the medications, there are, you, you know, there always been new medications coming out. There, there's one out there now called Lecvio. Uh, the trade name is Lecvio, um, L-E-Q-V-I-O. And it's a PCSK9, and it's not exactly like the other PCSK9 inhibitors, but it's actually given every six months uh, for patients to lower cholesterol by about 50%. And so we're we're going to continue to be uh, fighting against the the old the the paradigm of pills and procedures. There will always be new pills and new shots that are coming, uh, but certainly I think the tide is changing. Thanks in large part to people like uh, the, the panelists here and, and the doctors on the call. So strongly disagree so far. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Esbell. Dr. Brakey, your thoughts, please. Um, I agree with strongly disagree. Uh, the uh, our, uh, My doctors say here, or our fellow doctors have uh, outlined many of the points. And, and I guess that um, even in the standard medical literature, if you look at the USPSTF guidelines, uh, they recommend uh, primary prevention only for people with an estimated CBD risk of over 10%. Uh, 
Uh, and that's not even accounting for what we know about the underlying cause being inflammation from the standard American diet. Uh, so uh, there's uh, this woman uh, doesn't have diabetes, or hypertension, and we don't have the full history, but she doesn't have the common risk factors. So treating this this, this sign really uh, reminds me of a Dr. Clapper story. Um, he, he said, you're driving down the road and your, your check oil light comes on uh, and uh, you, you, you pull over and your engine's smoking a little bit and, and you pull out your, your, your wire clippers and you reach behind the dashboard and you clip the wire and you fixed it. The check oh. oil light's gone. Um, so in this case, the cholesterol is actually a, a symptom of uh, uh, probably what she has from backlog from previous uh, stored uh, saturated fats and cholesterol in her system, um, mm -hmm. or a normal elevated cholesterol from what her liver is making. Um, it's not a, a sign of, of uh, underlying progressive heart disease, especially if she's already uh, changed the, uh, the root cause for most people, which is her diet. So agree, don't just treat the, the symptom of a high number. Um, look at the total picture. Um, and uh, I don't know, I haven't uh, reviewed Dr. McDougall's uh, letters, he said, um, but I would reserve primary prevention uh, for someone with a familiar hyperlipidemia and LDL of over 190. Um, even then you have to think about the pros and cons with respect to statins increase in the risk of diabetes, uh, liver concerns, uh, chronic myalgias uh, uh, and uh, other potential side effects. Uh, so um, agree with strong, we disagree. Excellent, uh, thank you, Dr. Brakey. And uh, Dr. Clapper, um, before you resume, can you just tell us, do we know have any more information about the the plant-based diet that the patient was on? I'm sorry, say again? Do, I... do, we, do we have specific information about her so-called plant-based diet? Is it uh, a, healthy, a healthy diet? Right, no, it's people? a healthy diet, yes. Okay, okay. all right, please proceed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to point out, especially to the non-medical folks in the audience here, that uh, cholesterol is not an evil molecule. Your liver is making it as we're sitting here. Uh, your adrenal glands use it for storage synthesis. The liver makes bile out of it to absorb our fats. Our gonads make estrogen and uh, testosterone out of it. All our cells are using uh, uh, cholesterol. Uh, it, it's, it's not in itself uh, an, uh, an evil bad actor. Uh, and the liver is constantly excreting, uh, secreting bile down into the intestine, into the bloodstream. The small intestine is constantly reabsorbing that bile back into the bloodstream. And the total amount of cholesterol at any given moment is the balance between what the liver is uh, secreting, what the uh, intestine uh, is reabsorbing. Uh, and both of these organs are constantly being bombarded by chemical messengers coming up from the adrenals and uh, the ovaries and testicles, the microbiome and the gut, the thyroid uh, are, are all sending out chemical messages to these, organ, uh, to these organs about how much cholesterol they need in the blood at any given moment. Uh, the process of atherosclerosis um, is not just a matter of how high is your LDL. This is an inflammatory process. These arteries are being injured, uh, and the plaque formation is a response to the ongoing injury. Uh, what is doing the injury, in our humble opinion, at least mine, uh, it's, of course, the components of the standard Western diet uh, every four hours, whether it's the, uh, the bacon and eggs for breakfast, the cheeseburger for lunch, the fried chicken for dinner, um, uh, a flood of cooked animal muscle uh, uh, with all the uh, oxidized protein fragments, uh, the AGEs, the glycation end products, uh, come in through the bloodstream. Uh, if the person likes uh, fries with that or onion rings, then they're uh, eating the fryer oil, which is teeming with free radicals. Um, the meat in their diet is generating uric acid that uh, damages the endothelial lining, as does the high fructose corn syrup in their uh, desserts. And if they like cola drinks, they're drinking a solution of phosphoric acid. Uh, these are just some of the molecular marauders that damage the uh, endothelial lining of the arteries. Uh, and uh, 
if you, we've got a long-term plant eating woman with an elevated cholesterol, if she's sitting in the waiting room of the cardiologist next to a man eating the standard Western diet with the same level of cholesterol, they, uh, even though their total cholesterol numbers are the same, what's happening in their blood is not the same. In the meat eating man eating the standard Western diet, every third molecule of cholesterol in his bloodstream is cow cholesterol, it's chicken cholesterol, it's pig cholesterol, it's fish cholesterol. And it comes in with all the free radicals and the fryer oil and the uh, uh, AGEs, et cetera, that come along with that, uh, that style of eating. In the woman who is completely plant-based, every single one of those cholesterol molecules in her blood was put there by her own liver for its own reason, for more steroid synthesis, for storage of, of essential fatty acids. The, the liver knows what it's doing there, but they are not physiologically equal people, even though their total cholesterols might be the same number. Because it's the oxidized cholesterol that uh, is the most atherogenic particle, the question is what oxidizes cholesterol? Uh, if, we, uh, uh, if we see here in, the, uh, uh, in one of Dr. Esselstyn's classic uh, illustrations here, the, it's the oxidized LDL uh, that uh, uh, makes its way into the uh, deeper layers of the artery wall uh, that gets engulfed by the macrophages, turning the uh, macrophage into a foam cell, a cauldron of free radical uh, activity that sets off the inflammation that results in plaque formation. Well, what oxidizes the cholesterol? Uh, in my opinion, is the cooking of the animal muscle. It's broiling the steak, it's grilling the burger, it's putting that chicken carcass into hot fryer oil. Uh, that will turn that will oxidize cholesterol molecules into cholesterol peroxides. And it's these oxysterols, these cholesterol peroxides that are the uh, that are the oxidized LDL here that leads to the uh, formation of the plaque. So seeing that atherosclerosis process is an inflammatory process, uh, I tell my patients, don't just tell me your cholesterol number. I want to know your inflammatory markers, as Dr. Asbill referred to. Which inflammatory markers will give me the answer to the question, is the inflammatory fire of atherosclerosis burning in the walls of this person's arteries or not? As Dr. McDougall implied, the question is not how high is your cholesterol? The question is how healthy are your arteries? Is that inflammatory fire burning in the walls of the arteries or not? Well, the answer to that question is uh, contained in these six markers here. Um, if someone says, how am I doing, doctor? I would say, well, uh, here's the, uh, the this progression illustrated here. Uh, back when uh, all is healthy, the endothelial lining is healthy. But here along comes oxidized cholesterol, so I want to measure that. Um, but also, as the inflammation begins and the subendothelial layers start reacting, we get the early inflammatory markers. Prostaglandin 2 goes up in the form of F2 isoprostane. So I want to measure those two markers for early inflammation. As plaque actually begins to develop, then high sensitivity CRP begins to show up. And as this process uh, starts disrupting the endothelium in the vasculature of the kidney, that starts allowing albumin to leak into the urine. And traces of albumin show already your glycocalyx in the endothelium is becoming disrupted. That's an early sign of endothelium uh, dysfunction. And as the process continues and plaque is fully developed, as we know, the worst outcome is for the plaque to soften and then rupture. Why does the plaque soften and then rupture, setting off a, th a thrombus? Because the white cell gets invaded by uh, monocytes and neutrophils, and they start secreting enzymes to soften the plaque, and the two enzymes they use to soften the plaque is myeloperoxidase and lipoprotein phospholipase. And so these are the markers I want to know if, as far as assessing whether this person is at risk for plaque rupture uh, and thrombus formation. And if there's any further question about the true health of their arteries, I send them over to the ultrasound department and get an ultrasound scan of their carotid arteries, their abdominal aorta. Uh, um, this uh, information combined uh, lets me make an assessment about this patient. And so I find myself uh, with one of two, uh, with a fork in the road. Uh, 
if this patient has this woman, if all her markers of inflammation are negative, she does not have any elevation of oxidized cholesterol, CRP, micro, uh, no albumin in her urine, no myeloperoxides, no phospholipase, uh, no, uh, oh, uh, no um, uh, prostaglandin 2. Uh, sorry, I duplicated that. If these are all negative, and her carotid ultrasound is pristine, there's no thickening of the um, medial layer here, then in my book, this woman does not have the disease of atherosclerosis percolating in her artery walls, even though her cholesterol is 214. Uh, and in my humble opinion, she would not benefit from a statin. She does not have that disease. Uh, she needs to stay on her healthy whole food plant-based diet, lots of greens. Make sure we're not looking, as, because hypothyroidism can elevate cholesterol, make sure we're not looking at subclinical hypothyroidism. There's enough iodine and selenium in her diet, enough B12. But I would tell her, stay the course here, and let's just repeat these numbers um, in, uh, in 6, 12, or 18 months. Um, these are not exotic tests. Quest does them. LabCorp does them. Any doctor can order these tests. Now, the other fork in the road there is if these uh, uh, parameters are positive, if her oxide cholesterol is elevated, so is her HSCRP and, uh, and all the other ones, they're up. And her carotid scan looks like this. Yes, this woman has the disease. Yep, uh, no question. And she should go boots in on a reversal program, uh, such as the one Dr. Uh, Esselstyn recommends in his book. And, and I would be open to a cardiologist telling me that there's a role for statins in this. I'm, I would need a lot of convincing on that too. But because of the anti-inflammatory effects that statins can have in the artery wall, if, if they wanted to do 6, 12, 18 months of statins, okay, uh, this person has a disease and they need to do something about it in the uh, very immediate future. So finally, the question, well, do vegans and do complete plant eaters ever get atherosclerosis? Does that make them bulletproof? The answer is no. I've got a number of long-term vegans and animal rights folks in my practice with atherosclerosis. So what, what is to be considered if you've got a true plant eater who does have the disease? Uh, these are considerations. Uh, they say, doc, what should I do? Uh, first of all, make sure you're not looking at a, a familial hypercholesterolemia. These folks may need the help of a lipid specialist like Dr. Asbill. Um, and again, make sure you're not looking at undertreated hypothyroidism. Get a TSH and a thyroid panel. Absolutely. But again, the real question that Dr. Uh, Barnett and Dr. McDougall imply, what are they really eating? They may say, yeah, I'm plant-based, but are they junk food eaters that are damaging their glycocalyx and oxidizing their own cholesterol from fried foods and processed foods? Absolutely, that could be a, a, a culprit. Um, high fructose corn syrup and oils um, is a bad combination. I've got a patient in New Zealand with bad three-vessel disease in his heart. He says, Doc, I'm a bachelor. I live on peanut butter and fruit juice. I, I go through a gallon of grape juice every day and, and peanut butter sandwiches. Uh, and peanut oil is hard on the artery walls, and so is high fructose corn syrup. Yes, you can create atherosclerosis without meat with something like that, as well as just too much saturated fat in the diet will raise the cholesterol. Um, some of the people are coming to me, so I'm, I'm vegan and I've got uh, uh, clogged arteries, but well, how long have you been vegan? Well, three weeks ago, I went vegan. Well, they've, they've got severe artery disease to begin with. That's a, uh, they again, need the reversal program. Stress undoubtedly can play a role. If someone is constantly as family stress, money stress, whatever, uh, high cortisol levels probably play a role in this formation. If the person does not pay attention to their vitamin B12 levels and homocysteine goes up, homocysteine can damage the arteries and uh, open the door to atherosclerotic plaque formation. And finally, if, I've, if this woman uh, with her clean diet and lifestyle still has significant atherosclerotic disease, I get concerned, we there might be looking at an infection. There are some organisms, uh, chlamydia, pneumonia, H. pylori, that seem to be able to stimulate this process. And uh, if I'm totally stumped, if none of these other uh, factors are um, uh, at play, uh, I would draw antibodies against chlamydia pneumonia and H. H. pylori. And if they are markedly elevated, I consider a course of azithromycin or similar antibiotics. So finally, um, I think we cannot 
dismiss the powerful disease reversing plaque melting effect of Dr. Esselstyn's reversal diet, which is a complete plant based diet, uh, very, very low fat. Um, uh, we, I, we need to take, uh, we need to, as clinicians, pay homage to the fact that almost 200 patients, and all of them, all of them had serious significant artery disease. They all had stents and MIs. And he followed them on his program for four years. And during that time, with an an, average annual risk of 7.5%, there should have been 60 major adverse cardiac events. There should have been 60. MIs and strokes and sudden deaths, zip. That is profound. That makes you say, stop the presses. This is a powerful tool. And of the people who had angina, nine out of 10 of them got their angina improved. This is no humbug. This is a powerful, powerful tool. And again, the controls who weren't adherent, uh, over half of them had an adverse effect. So uh, seeing if uh, people were paying attention. Dr. Dr. Clapper. Dr. Yes. Clapper, I'm going to interrupt you before we get to the poll. Yes. I would, I would like to hear from our cardiologist, uh, Dr. Asbel, about that list of tests that um, Dr. Uh, Clapper gave there. Can you go back to that list of tests? Yeah. That would be great. I'd love to. Uh, just can you see them? Your, um, yes, there they are at the bottom there. And plus the uh, carotid ultrasound. What it, plus, uh, right. What it would be your approach to this, Dr. Asbel? Well, as I said earlier, I, I think this is exactly the sort of patient that I would want to know more. Uh, I think I do recommend in my patients uh, some of these, but not all of these markers. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been getting oxidized LDL cholesterol, HSCRP, and myeloperoxidase. So I go with the odd numbers here. Okay. Uh, and, you know, because I feel like they they represent several steps in that inflammatory cascade, as you can see, oxidized cholesterol, obviously, as Dr. Clapper said, very early stage of inflammation, uh, HSCRP more sort of in the middle and myeloperoxidase, really looking more later at, at risk of plaque rupture. So I would do those things. And, and as I also said, I would look at some sort of evaluation of, of whether or not this patient has subclinical or asymptomatic vascular disease. I was not in the practice, quite frankly, of doing much carotid into media thickness, the IMT. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really because I think that that I think it's a great test in the right hands. I think that it you're a little dependent on the sonographer there. Um, this is we're measuring um, very small sub millimeter changes in intima media thickness. And if you're not skilled at doing this and you do it in a hurry, you know, you're just going to get bad data. So I think you have to have a really, you have to have a sonographer that you can trust. And if you do have one that, you know, does a really good job of this test, fantastic test. I was, I, I tended to do more um, coronary artery calcium scores in mm -hmm. my practice. You know, it, it has its downsides as well. Maybe we can go into that in more detail later, but that, um, I tended to do more coronary calcium scores because I think that it's just easy, so easy and so reproducible. But uh, I think this is a great way to do it. Check check the labs, look for inflammation, check for asymptomatic up subclinical disease. And then you know a lot more and you can have a, a really very different conversation with the patient about what do we do now? Well, that's great. Thank you. Uh, since you mentioned calcium, uh, coronary artery uh, calcium scoring, that there was a question in the chat about that. So when would you recommend a calcium? Uh, score. Yeah. I, I use it most of the time in these situations. Uh, you know, primary prevention. I don't know if you have the disease or not. If you have a zero calcium score, you know, I, I think it's really, it's, it's a for sure don't. Uh, we, we do have good data mm -hmm. of who had high cholesterol and zero calcium scores. And if you treat those patients with statins, you absolutely, there are no data that you are decreasing their event rate. So no reason to treat. Um, you know, over a hundred, you know, somebody who had a very high calcium score indicating that they have a lot of subclinical disease. It's just like the patient here that he showed with the CIMT with, with plaque. Uh, it's, a, it's a different conversation. Do you, or do, you, do you not treat with the statin? Personally, in that situation, it, it, it again depends that if it had been three weeks since they've been on the diet, give them more time. If they've been on this diet for a long time 
and their markers are still, their inflammatory markers are still elevated. Why? Uh, thank you, Dr. Asbel. Uh, that was excellent. Um, Michael, do you want to just, uh, Dr. Clapper, do you want to proceed to the poll here? Okay. I think we'll All right. Fair enough. Go to the poll, please. And uh, Bob, there, there's the poll, everybody. So, um, Michael, you want to read uh, your... Which of the following uh, can contribute to arterial plaque in long-term plant eaters? Excessive fructose in the diet, excessive advanced glycation end, process, uh, end products and processed foods, elevated homocysteine levels from B12 deficiency, excess stress, or all of the above? Pick one. Let's take a look. What did we, what did we get? We're going to ask Dr. Brakey to react to the, mm -hmm. to the poll here. We're going to ask Dr. Brakey to react to the, to the poll here and uh, the questions in the poll. There we go. Uh, the audience got uh, the right answer. Uh, these are all um, challenging uh, concerns on a non-whole food plant-based diet. I guess one caveat I'd, I'd uh, make, uh, though, is that fructose, when it comes in fruit, uh, right. seems to yeah. be fine. Yeah, I should have phrased that better. So I realized that it's just, yeah. just, just now. Sorry about it. No, fruit in, in fructose in the yeah. form of fruit, it seems to be benign. Yeah. yeah. The, the group out of Toronto that did the uh, glycemic index studies gave people as many 20 servings of fruit a day, and it didn't have any adverse consequences in terms of ad, uh, cholesterol or uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and that's because it comes along with uh, phytonutrients and protein and fiber and other parts that lead to slower absorption. Uh, versus the high fructose corn syrup, uh, which is so common. Um, we, we subsidize the growing of corn, uh, make this a very cheap additive that's addictive. Um, it's, it's so prevalent in so many um, processed foods uh, and uh, horrible, uh, also contributing to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, and uh, systemic inflammation. Um, uh, for sure, the excessive AGEs uh, and uh, um, add to those the... Um, Heme iron and, and red meats, arachidonic acid, mostly in chicken and eggs, uh, TMAOs from metabolism from choline and carnitine in meat, and you get systemic inflammation uh, throughout the body from the um, both the animal foods uh, and the processed foods. Um, and uh, sometimes I do measure homocysteine levels, uh, B12 levels, to, to take a look um, at uh, uh, whether those are uh, commonly, of course, B12 levels, just to make sure uh, especially for people who are plant-based and somehow don't think they need it, um, uh, that uh, they, they, they should be taking that as, as a given. Um, and, uh, and then stress can be uh, systemic uh, stress also create inflammation. Well, Dr. Barnett, uh, can I just... Yeah, absolutely. I was, Dr. McDougall, I was just about to call on you. I was going to add some thoughts here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've seen a few patients in, in my career, which we... We did study with, with heart scans, looking mm -hmm. for calcium scores, who had cholesterols in the 350 range, who couldn't take statins. And so even though I was inclined to put them on statins, when we studied them, their, their arteries were baby clean. Mm -hmm. So you just might put that away someplace. You know, it's even when you're pretty sure that something's going to come up in terms of a positive calcium score, it hasn't in several patients that I've taken care of. They've been very clean. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is this idea of stress uh, being a cause of coronary artery disease. And I think back about <clears throat> the World War I and World War II studies in Western Europe, when, you know, I can't imagine more stress than what happened when Nazi Germany invaded Western Europe. It, it had to be absolutely horrible. And yet the death rate from heart disease plummeted. You know, yeah. and there are countries where, you know, they have problems with children and infidelity and financial problems like Japan and China and so on, that had virtually no heart disease prior to the introduction of the Western diet. So I challenge the idea that stress is a major component, plus I wouldn't know how to take care of it. You know, when you go out <laughs> and play, play a little baseball or see a like, oh, what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. You know, it's really tough. The, the last sure. thing I'd like to add is that I flunked my calcium score when I was 35 years old. Of course, some of you who know my history know that I weighed 90 pounds more than I weigh now. I used to have a cholesterol of 330, and I had a massive stroke at 18, which left me hemiplegic for 58 years now. Well, when I was 35, I had a calcium score, and it was over 300. And of course, the technician wanted to send me right out to the cath lab. And I said, no, 
because I knew, and the fact that I'm 76 now and, and still hike and windsurf, et cetera, without chest pain, I have to believe it's true. I knew that calcium score represented my past and the way I used to take care of myself, you know, the bacon and eggs, and I deserve to have a stroke. I deserve to have a cholesterol of 330 because of the way I eat, but I didn't eat that way anymore. And so for the next 40 years, you know, I've, I've remained at least clinically mm -hmm. free of atherosclerosis because I changed, caused the problem. Now, the last thing I'd like to comment on is what a calcium score means. <clears throat> calcium is the end product of, of inflammation. And our body also has a certain way of dealing with uh, damage and healing inflammation. And that is that, uh, that it lays down scar tissue and it lays down calcium. And we see this calcium deposition in other diseases of chronic inflammation. Like for example, bursitis, uh, tendonitis. If you've taken x-rays of people's bursas and tendons who have had chronic illness, chronic pain, in those particular areas, you see calcium deposition. Uh, I don't know how they teach it today, but millerary, millerary calcification was the way you diagnosed tuberculosis on a chest x-ray, because mm -hmm. you had chronic inflammation all over the lungs. Today, we have mammography done. And what is the most common report for mammography that concerns a woman? She has calcification. She has calcification in her milk ducts due to chronic inflammation from the Western diet. So calcification is nothing special. It's just the way the body deals with inflammation. It's the end stage mm -hmm. of inflammation. These are all hard rocks. They're scars. The scars never rupture. The scars are their history. And if you mm -hmm. stop making new inflammation in the arteries, in other words, creating mm -hmm. pustules that rupture, then you're gonna avoid clinical events. I don't plan on having another stroke or my first heart attack. And I think that I probably, have, I got what I deserved before I was 35. And hopefully I can say I got what I deserve since then. Well, Dr. McDougall, I think you make ex a couple of excellent points. And as a radiologist, I had uh, actually brought, had one of the first sc uh, CAT scanners from the late nineties that could do calcium artery scoring. And I always felt kind of funny about it because as you say, the calcification that you see, that's history, right? Uh, and those are not the plaques. That, the plaques that rupture and kill you all of a sudden don't, aren't, not, aren't gonna show up because they're not calcified. So um, I'm just curious uh, what Dr. Asbel thinks about the coronary artery scoring, because I, I sort of have the same reaction. You could have a completely normal coronary well, the artery correlation score. There, the correlation there is the people who have terrible calcium scores generally haven't changed their behavior. So right. what so got a, them the high right. calcium score, they continued that kind of eating. Right. And, but it was different in my case. And, and also, I right. like to believe from my patients, is you stop that behavior and the disease stops. Whether it reverses or not, I think some of it does. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think these scars do. I don't think these calcium deposits do. Right. But I have some evidence that they do reverse. So if you want to go into that, I'll give it to you. But, sure. you know, uh, even though this particular patient, you know, is there your midlife, and most of our patients have already done a lot of damage done by notes to themselves. I think we can offer an awful lot of encouragement. All right, mm -hmm. you got a bad calcium score. No, the cardiologist is not the next place to go. The next place to go is to dietitian, so you don't make this score worse, so you don't really get into trouble. So I, I think we have to frame things in terms of what the reality is, in terms of the the activity of the disease, and how it really applies to the patient. And that's but mm -hmm. I've tried to clear up in terms of the calcium score. I, I have not gotten another calcium scan since then. So I have no idea whether any of my calcium went away or not. But the, 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 first, the first inclination of the tactician was, you need to have heart surgery, buddy. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Dr. Asbill, your thoughts, please? Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I agree with, with Dr. McDougall and with you that the calcium is, a, is an end stage marker. What to me, what it is indicating in a patient when when you check a calcium score, I see. By the way, I, I see very little utility, if any, in following a calcium score. It is a marker of disease, and once you've identified it, there's just no reason to to repeat it. In my opinion, the guidelines I think would say never repeat it before five years, but I say maybe never repeat it at all. 
I think what it does is it tells you that there's soft plaque. I'm not worried about the calcified lesions rupturing. I am worried about the soft plaque rupturing. And that's really the problem with coronary calcium scoring. I think that eventually, if we can get the price down and the radiation and the dye down, a CT angiogram would be sort of a, uh, a similar test in, in some respects looking at CIMT, but of course there's no radiation with the uh, ultrasound, so better test. If we can figure out a way to do for, for cheap at no risk uh, or at very low risk to look at the coronary arteries in the same way that we can easily access the neck arteries, um, that would be preferred because really what we're looking for is, is soft plaque for sure. So the calcium score here is a marker that there, if you've got a calcified plaque, almost certainly you've got some soft plaque elsewhere. Right. And I, I think we're overlooking a serious risk. And that is that the patient's calcium score will be zero, or at least very good. Uh, when one of my points in practice, uh, we had a uh, a calcium score business come into town. They were, you know, doing tests on the population, and I wanted them to come into my clinic and do calcium scores on my patients. We worked out a decent price. If they had a mobile unit, we could do it. And then the guy who owned the machine told me, "Yeah." I got my calcium score done last week. And guess what? I went out and ate myself a great big steak. Right. Because it was zero. So I think one of, one of the, the hazards that we don't need to forget about having a calcium score is it may give them information that would lead somebody to not change their diet and, and other behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think that's, a good point. that's what I worry people. about. Yeah, it's good, to, it's good to have a high calcium score because then you're going to behave better. So. I would think so. I mean, I, I, was, I certainly would be motivated. I, I yeah. have people with calcium scores that are out of this world. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Dr. Clapper, I think it's time to move on, please. Okay. So um, so this is my basic algorithm. This is the last slide. This is basic algorithm. What, what do you do uh, when, that, when you're faced with a patient um, with the, this dilemma, high cholesterol, um, in a plant-eating person? Um, and if the cardiologist is saying your cholesterol is 220, the statistics clearly say that you are at high risk for a heart attack or stroke. Um, the, the asterisk there is yes, those numbers that is, say a higher risk with those with the higher cholesterol numbers, all those studies are done in people eating the standard American diet. They, they, are, they don't have clean whole food plant eating vegans in that study population. Uh, and uh, there should be, I think, a little asterisk saying uh, with these uh, risk uh, uh, ratios there uh, in patients eating the standard American diet who are injuring their arteries three times a day. These are the risk factors if you're in that group. Uh, this person is not in that group. So what do we say they should do? First of all, don't panic as, uh, the, over these numbers. Second, uh, as you heard me recommend, I would uh, get these uh, markers of inflammation. If you just want to get the three that Dr. Asbo recommended, yes, those are the three, the oxidized cholesterol, the HSCRP, and the myeloperoxidase of absolutely reasonable uh, assortment. Gives you a fair picture of what's happening there. Uh, and then if there's any questions, especially any history of suggestive of a TIA or whatever, absolutely uh, consider visualizing their uh, vasculature in some form, ultrasound or CTA or whatever. And depending on what you get from two or three, as I had a slide with all the green arrows, if if their inflammatory markers are negative and their uh, and their uh, uh, imaging of their arteries is, is negative, then at this point, I don't think they are at high risk. I, they certainly don't need a statin. They need to tighten up their diet and uh, make sure it's whole food, plant-based, uh, et cetera. Uh, we can't forget number six, the other lifestyle pillars there, stop eating sugar, get enough rest, take a walk every day, stop smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, uh, going back up to number four there, if you, if your markers come back positive or the, the scan comes back, you have obvious plaque, uh, then uh, you want to jump on a plaque reversal program like Dr. Esselstyn uh, uh, recommends uh, to the letter uh, and eat those greens during the day to uh, uh, to help melt away those plaques as the, all the uh, antioxidants seep into the plaque and deepen the artery walls there and help reverse the plaque there. And then finally, you don't send this patient off 
uh, into the wilderness uh, without follow-up. You didn't have an agreement. Okay, uh, your cholesterol is up, but your inflammatory markers were negative. Your scan is clear. Uh, let's let's repeat this and and pick an interval. Leave no no sooner than six months, but uh, let's repeat this in a year and see if it's moving one way or the other. And you just keep repeating this as annual tests and uh, decide whether any further testing or adjustment is needed, follow their thyroid function along, et cetera. Uh, but this, I think, would uh, this uh, progression gives a uh, fairly good rationale for, uh, uh, for giving these patients uh, uh, reasonable guidance. So um, we're finally at the last poll question. And uh, just see if you're paying attention which of these... Uh, uh, which of these markers uh, are part of the uh, battery that one could order for a uh, uh, for assessment of the health and inflammation of the artery walls? Uh, one of one of these tests does not give you that information. Uh, uh, see if you can identify uh, which test uh, does is not like the others, which does not belong there. As far as tests you can order to answer the question, does this person have artery disease or don't they? Is it an oxidized cholesterol, uh, the uh, isoprostane F2, uh, the HSCRP, alkaline phosphatase, microalbumin in the urine, myeloperoxidase, phospholipase, or an ultrasound survey of the arteries, uh, which of them will not give you information about the health of the artery walls? Okay, well, uh, eight out of 10 realize that alkaline phosphate is very interesting and, and information uh, full of uh, uh, information bountiful uh, tests and alkaline phosphate for liver function, but doesn't really help us as far as the uh, arterial inflammation goes. So yeah, alkaline phosphate doesn't belong in that battery. That's correct. Okay, so uh, the rest are just the um, uh, the citations of validating the use of these uh, of these uh, tests as far as inflammation goes. So, um, so hopefully we're at the end of my slides and uh, we made some sense of this very complex problem. Uh, so I will relinquish the controls and turn it back to Dr. Barnett. Great, thank you, Dr. Brake. We haven't heard from you in a bit. What are, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Well, well, yeah, first, uh, Dr. Clapper, yeah, thank first, you very much. Yeah, bravo, Dr. Clapper. Uh, that, that was a great uh, overview with uh, an excellent uh, um, review of complex subject. And, um, you know, they, they hinted at this back in medical school that it was inflammation and cholesterol, but it was really more all about smoking and other risk factors. And the reality is, as you, as you and Dr. McDo, Dr. Espel have all pointed out, that this is not really a disease at all. This is a condition. Uh, caused by predictable metabolic disturbance from the wrong food for the wrong animal. Um, and if you, um, you know, as, as John says, if you feed your oats and hay to your cat and your tuna fish and your chicken to your horse, they don't do very well. Um, and as we, uh, I remember that, John, from your original book. Uh, <laughs> so so we, we're finding that, you know, if you keep spilling hot coffee on yourself, you get burned. If you keep eating the foods that clog the arteries, they, they continue to be clogged. And once you stop that process, the healing mechanism goes into place. Um, so I, I thank you so much for bringing forth a, a case, a history. Um, I guess one other question I'd have for you and the panel would be, what about that person who does have a history of CAD? Uh, say they, they had a, a, a minor heart attack, required a, a stent, and now their cardiologist is insisting they get down to 60 for their LDL. Um, and they're, they're at... Uh, you know, I don't know, Brian, what do you think? Their LDL gets down to 80. Um, their whole food plant-based, their inflammation markers are low. Um, their cardiologist beating on them. No, you've got to get it down. you got to get it down. Uh, are we okay in coaching them to say, hey, uh, you're close enough because you're not inflamed? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I think there, somebody I saw in the chat, um, I couldn't respond to the chat and listen to Dr. Clapper at the same time. But uh, somebody had mentioned when when should we do additional lipid testing? I, I think that I think LDL is really not a great marker of of atherogenic burden, frankly. You know, I, I think on the standard lipid profile, I think that non-HDL is a better marker, which mm -hmm. is 
So most people I'm sure are familiar with that, total cholesterol minus the HDL. So you're left with all the atherogenic particles, LDL, IDL, VLDL. Um, ApoB, someone asked in the chat, you know, should we, when should we, and should we check an ApoB? Frankly, I think an ApoB, apolipoprotein B, which is a protein on, on the surface of every atherogenic particle, is a better marker. That's, that's really what we should be tracking, ultimately. Uh, risk of cardiovascular events tracks more with atherogenic particles than with the LDL cholesterol, which is how much cholesterol is being carried in your circulation in an LDL particle. So I think we need to look at particle number and we can do that with ApoB or we can do that with LDL particle number, you know, pick pick whichever you're comfortable with. But that's really a better marker because certainly we've seen patients with elevated LDL cholesterol who have a low ApoB or LDL particle number and they do better than people with a low LDL, but a high ApoB or L high LDL particle number. So we're probably ultimately, honestly, measuring the wrong thing, but that's probably going to be said of a lot of things that we're doing now in another hundred years. <laughs> I'd like to add that uh, Dr. Dean Arnish, when he uh, when he presented his his patient population, he didn't find atherosclerosis reversal very well correlated with drops in cholesterol. What he found was the greatest correlation was the participants' adherence to the program. And I think that really says it all. You know, one, mm -hmm. of, one of the questions I, I have for any, any of the experts on the panel is uh, what do what these extra tests add for you? It, does, it, does it add your ability to make a guess? Is there any quantitation to how good this guess is? I mean, I, I'm an old country doctor and for me, total cholesterol is enough. I don't need to know all the fractions, all the other variations. You know, I know what needs to be done. And I have a, a simple, you know, five dollar cost test that I can have people repeat on their own. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I just haven't gotten into all that high tech medicine. Total cholesterol is enough for me, and uh, you know, I can make I can make a, a good enough guess on that particular number. And my guess is you're just guessing with these other factors. If you mm -hmm. feel otherwise, let me know. D Dr. Brakey, you look like you. Uh... You're amused by the question. So, what is your response uh, to that? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in between. I'm also, a, 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 I'm, I'm almost as old as John. He was one of my early mentors, and I'm, I'm so honored to be on a panel with uh, such distinguished uh, uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, indeed, you can get. It's like a lot of things. Uh, you can get eighty percent of the way there with with total cholesterol. Um, that that kind of gives you a big a big piece. And I think what we're what we're finding, though, is that that other twenty percent in the gray areas, or the people with uh, you know um, borderline disease, or what Dr. Clapper said, already plant based, does give you additional information that helps sway you. Uh, so, so I, I I see your point, John, and and uh, I also see a, a place for it in the gray areas. I know, Michael, well, just, maybe you have a good answer for for well, why. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna. Uh, we're gonna I'm going to interrupt for one second here. So one more little announcement before we get back to the just really fascinating conversation is that after the conversation ends, we are going to show people on the uh, uh, who want to stick around uh, the forum that we have developed for people who are interested in continuing this conversation about uh, the fascinating cases that we present every month uh, in a safe environment. It's face it's like Facebook, but it's not, and there's no advertising, uh, and it's our own. Uh, uh, um, Facebook-like form that we have uh, built called OnePaleBlue.Earth. And in addition to being about um, lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition, it's also about how we can go about uh, addressing the pressing issues of planetary health, which are becoming, uh, uh, maybe coming out even faster than we were expecting. People in the Southwest now underneath the heat dome. We're up in the Northeast now where Vermont is underwater. Uh, and uh, there's uh, fires all over California. So those are um, extremely important issues which we would like to address in this forum that we have developed. And stick around, we'll show you. It's actually much more interesting than I've made it sound. Anyway, let's go um, on to the uh, conversation. Um, there we had, a, um, let's see. Doctor, uh, let me, if I could just ask a couple of questions from the chat here. Uh, somebody says, if you have a history of hypercholesterolemia, you can't reliably use cholesterol levels to assess their present risk or is this just for calcium scores? I think that was in response to the 
comment about calcium. Let's see here. How do you, okay, so if you have a history of hypercholesterolemia, how should you interpret calcium artery scoring? Um, let, let's ask that from Dr. Asbel again as well. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I'm not sure I really quite follow the question, to be honest, but the cholesterol doesn't really always track with the calcium score. I mean, I think it was Dr. McDougall who mentioned patient with a total cholesterol of 300, which I've had too. It's a bell-shaped curve all the time. So we're, we're playing to that, you know, one standard deviation from the mean. We're going to have patients who have cholesterols, as Dr. McDougall mentioned, I have one too, th total cholesterol of 300, whistle clean arteries. What's going on? I don't know. We have patients with terrible looking arteries with cholesterols that are relatively low, a total cholesterol of 170. You know, why does that patient have such bad disease? It, there's so many factors at play. I, I kind of chuckle, honestly, sometimes at the whole term expert. You know, we, we an expert hopefully has enough humility to recognize that the more you learn, the less you really know that you know. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we don't know everything. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be really interesting in the future to be looking at genetics, uh, looking at, and I think this is a polygenic uh, disease process. Brian, when, when you say we don't understand why the person with the relatively low cholesterol gets artery disease, isn't it an artifact, a matter of how he's treating those arteries, what he's doing to those artery walls every four hours? is That's the issue, not the number but, of the you cholesterol. Know, yeah. You know, I've had patients, I had a patient, I, I don't like to practice anecdotal medicine, but we all have, have these examples. I had a patient with a total cholesterol of 160, 167, 160s total cholesterol. I don't remember the, the subfractions who had been on a plant-based diet, a, a good plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based, no SOS diet for several years, two, three years, uh, who had an LAD stent with unstable angina, didn't have a big infarct and no heart damage occurred. But uh, I did not at the time because it was in the setting of having had a heart attack, the inf inflammation, the inflammatory markers, I thought were gonna be falsely elevated, didn't check them. Uh, this was about eight years ago. Uh, why would that patient have had this event? I, I don't know historically what their cholesterol was. I mean, maybe they just had terrible disease, but it was just a very isolated LDL, pretty smooth looking arteries, really very minimal diffuse atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries, at least, but with an LDL plaque that ruptured, uh, you know, total cholesterol in the 160s, the heck. So mm -hmm. there, there, there are these going to be these outliers where we just kind of scratch our heads and say, wow. Uh, again, I don't know, but you're right. For for 99.9% .9 of the people, we do know what's happening with, with those patients. I'm a little more puzzled by the total cholesterol that would be in the familial hypercholesterolemia range, you know, LDL of 210 and a total cholesterol of 350 and completely normal arteries. That's just, uh, it's an interesting situation. You know, Dr. Asbel, it makes me think of that case that everybody shows all the time from Dr. Esselstyn's book, the 44-year-old guy uh, with a left anterior descending, uh, you know, diffuse severe disease, at least for a segment. Uh, he was 44 years old, and his, I think his cholesterol was about 160. Uh, and, and it com completely resolved. It makes you think that it may well have been just one of these inflammatory lesions. Could have been, yeah. 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 Ted, if I could, I, I, sure. I think your, you know, Brian, your, your comment about outliers is pertinent because, as you say, bell curve, uh, it means that there are going to be people on either end of the spectrum who just don't seem to fit. But the other comment I'd make, if you look in the China study, their cholesterols range from 88 to uh, 150 with an average of 127. So 160 would be off the scale. If you look at rural China or uh, Rwanda, Africa, where heart disease simply doesn't exist. Um, in the Framingham, it was kind of 150 or less where we didn't see heart disease, but again, relatively small numbers in that subclass. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're all going to see outliers. Um, and a part of what we have to recognize is that what seems like extremely low to us um, is extremely high by the standard of, of what a normal human on a normal human diet would usually be. Same with blood pressure. Blood pressure, you, you know, we learned in medical school, 100 plus your age is systolic pressure. Well, in, in populations and blue zones, it goes down with age. It starts at about 115 over 70, and it goes down to 110 uh, over, over 60 um, by the time they're 95. Um, 
the, the arteries don't normally clog, the bones don't normally melt away, the, the, the body doesn't degenerate when you, um, it, on average, uh, again, exceptions to all this, um, but, uh, but we also have to remember when we do it, it's always compared to what, and relative to standard American, it seems like, wow, how could that happen? But by world standards, a lot of these people are sick from before they're born. You know, they, they did uh, artery uh, autopsies on miscarriages, and already they had uh, fatty streaks on coronary arteries correlated with the mom's uh, cholesterol levels. Um, so so it, it starts early, it accelerates when you when you give the wrong food to the wrong animal. It's, it's chicken and cheese and French fries all over again. Yeah. I'd like to add something else that might be helpful to this whole discussion is, you know, I have a unique opportunity of, uh, of housing people, of putting them in a, in a a clinic situation where I, I can observe them carefully and know exactly what they eat. And uh, the majority of people who come in to see us who say they're on a very strict vegan diet and they don't understand why their cholesterol is still high, in the 12 days that we spend with them or 10 days we spend with them, guess what? Their cholesterol has dropped 20 or 30 points. So there's always the factor of a misunderstanding, misinterpretation, of what really a healthy diet is. And I think you need to approach each and every patient with that kind of possible misunderstanding and, and not give up on them like this lady, you know, who you may say, well, she already follow, follows a really good diet. Well, maybe she doesn't, right. you know, maybe she doesn't really understand. And, and uh, as again, well, I had a chance, I have had a chance to lock up to over 6,000 people for 10 to 12 days. And almost every time, they follow the diet strictly, but during that 10 to 12 days, they lost weight, cholesterol went down, blood pressure went down, they got off the medications. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something really important, I think, taking care of patients. I think that's right. Um, if there's anybody in the audience, we can uh, open this up. If anybody wants to raise their hand, uh, we'd be happy to let people in the audience ask their questions so I don't have to keep reading the chat. <laughs> Melanie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much, everybody. And for me personally, um, I, um, I've i been whole food plant-based about five and a half years and uh, I had my blood work done. Um, it was about a month before I did the quick start um, or the jump start with Dr. Barnett in the group. And um, I got my blood work checked and I thought, you know, maybe I'll do another little tweak. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because my cholesterol still, whole food plant-based, still hovers right around 200, a little less than that. And my LDL is hanging around, uh, around 100. And so six days before getting my blood work done, this is before the jumpstart, um, I decided to, um, that I would just make a little modification. So I took things out like, I um, think I'd been eating crackers occasionally and some other little things like that. Six days. And in six days, my cholesterol, my overall dropped 25 points and my LDL dropped, uh, I think it was 17 points in like mm -hmm. six days. And so what that said to me, because I was thinking maybe I had the LP little a, you know, like maybe I had this genetic predisposition to have higher cholesterol. And just like you were saying, Dr. McDougall, uh, you know, if you locked me up <laughs> right, and I didn't have access to that stuff, like I now believe that it's possible that I could get my cholesterol a good bit lower. There were oils that I was sneaking in and I was not no oil before that, but just taking out some of those oils, I had a 25 point drop in six days. So I'm, I think I can do much better. So thank you. I really appreciate this conversation. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Um, I noticed Dr. Mercia, uh, Vikas Mercia is out there. You had some stuff in the chat. Did you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Hey, how are you? Great. Um, how are you? Very well. So, you know, I, I think... I'm in that same situation where I've been whole food plant-based now for about three and a half years. And like Melanie was saying, maybe there's a little cheat that goes on every now and then. And and my my cholesterol is always hovering around 200. It's just kind of hard to, to get it to go much lower than that. You know, I, I try to be 
a model, but th there are times when, when things do sneak in. So um, I had a coronary calcium uh, score done, I don't know, like 15, 16 years ago. I haven't had one done since. I've just, I, I my high sensitivity CRP is like super low. It's less than 0.3 or something like that, you know? Um, what what should I be doing? I mean, I'm not on any statins. I don't take any of those things. I, I, I tried taking them. I developed all kinds of muscle aches and pains and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, is it just being a little more focused on, on the diet and avoiding any of those things that kind of sneak in like the crackers or, or should I kind of completely go off of all nuts and everything to not have any uh, nuts that may be contributing to this? Um, Thoughts? Yeah. yeah, Dr. McDougal, you have your hand up. Well, well I was going to say something else, but yeah, oh, okay. I, I think I, I think that, uh, you know, for a lot of people, psychologically, it's important to have a low number. And there are safer ways to get lower numbers, like berberine, for example, uh, is a, a very powerful new supplement that's quite popular. I, I'm, I don't recommend supplements, and I really haven't treated anybody with that particular uh natural medication. But if you just need a lower number, you know, there are various ways to get it. You could spend $15,000 a year getting it or $500 a month or, you know, $10 a, a month or whatever. And if psychologically, you and I don't say this lightly, you know, sometimes you just need to see a better number to have a better day. But you need to put it in perspective. And that is that does not translate into the kind of healthy life that you want to have. But, you know, numbers are important. I know that from taking care of so many patients, as I'm sure each and every one of you do. Those numbers make or break their day. So, you know, I, I would either encourage you to live with a number of 200 or, uh, you know, do an experiment like we talked about, about really, really being strict. Or uh, take something to lower the numbers, to make the numbers look better. You know, I treat psychological problems, too. <laughs> But th this is what I call the tyranny of the numbers. We give these numbers so much power that they uh, destroy our whole day here. The question is not how high is your cholesterol. The question is how healthy are your arteries, sir? Get these inflammatory markers done. Get a scan of your arteries and see what's really going on in there. You're, trust your liver. It, it needed to keep 200 milligrams of cholesterol in your bloodstream for steroid synthesis or testosterone synthesis. That's not the disease of atherosclerosis. That's a physiological logic hypercholesterolemia, but it's not the inflammatory fire of atherosclerosis burning in your arteries. Get those inflammatory markers, assess the true health of your arteries, and then, as Dr. McDougall says, 200 might be a perfectly fine number for you that your liver needs to maintain, but it does not pose a risk to you. So check out the artery health rather than the cholesterol numbers. I wanted to add one more thing to this discussion, and that has to do with various kinds of oils. Uh, back in the 1970s, we had the Finnish hospital study and the veteran study done, where we believed at that time that the, the answer was to switch to a vegetable oil diet. And so we put in these randomized control trials where people were housed, we put them on corn oil, which is an omega-3 fat, or excuse me, an omega-6 fat. And when they were finally studied uh, about, uh, oh, about eight, 10 years ago in the British journals, what we found was compared to those who stayed on the Western diet, those on the corn oil diet, the omega-6 fat diet, had terribly worse looking arteries. Hmm. You know, so, but corn oil lowers cholesterol. You know, so you gotta be careful about that it's the right diet. And I think most of us agree that's a, a diet based on plant foods, but I go one step further. And that is, it's a diet based on starches, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, et cetera. Yeah. That's right. It's always compared to what, and the, the omega-6s uh, preferentially create more inflammation uh, by outnumbering the omega-3s. And it, to, to Dr. Clapper's point, that's really the root cause of this, which then allows whatever cholesterol level you've got to get in the arteries and create the inflammation. So yeah, those, those, uh, plant, uh, those plant oils heavy in omega-6s end up with a significant imbalance, stimulating arachidonic acid, uh, chronic inflammation. Um, and then, um, okay, sorry, go ahead, Ted, you're about to call. I was going to add, uh, they, they've done some studies where they actually take uh, thermometers, you know, really micro thermometers, 
and they uh, put them on a catheter and they measure the heat of the artery with the idea that, you know, the, the hotter arteries would reflect inflammation and uh, possibly a plaque rupture. But of course, that's not a very practical thing to do. We don't have the technology and, and uh, it's not been well studied. What technology we do have is we have a technology that is very good at looking at hard, fibrous, non-lethal scars, which are called plaques, which is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar year business. So why do they look at the scars? Because they can. Why don't they look at direct signs of inflammation? Because they can't. But believe me, when, when our technology gets to the point where we can do direct measurements, say, for example, the heat of that particular section of the artery, we're going to be spe specialists that uh, catheterize with thermometers, and that's going to be the new trend. We do those things. Us doctors do. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, well, uh, I see Dr. Yoon has said in the uh, chat that she, uh, based on, she's agreeing with you, Dr. McDougall. Based on my own clinical experience, I agree with Dr. McDougall. Lock them up in a room and let's see what people are really eating in moderation. <laughs> We will see an entirely different picture. I love it. That's great. So, um, yeah, D Dr. Clapper, any uh, any final cl closing words before we we're, we're going to do a little demonstration of the forum that uh, we're going to be inviting people to uh, every month uh, to continue these conversations. Uh, Dr. Barnett, I, I, I see a couple of hands up. Are you missing them? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, I I'm not seeing them. But yeah, go ahead, go ahead and call on them because I'm not seeing them. Gaia, go ahead, Gaia, Kyle. There's Jane. Yeah, and I had a I had a question about um, the um, the this this measurement of oxidative cholesterol. I've been hesitant to use that test, and the reason why is that my understanding is that the cholesterol molecules will get into the plaque and then oxidize, and so the the problem is inside of the plaque that they're oxidized. But when they're flo floating around in the bloodstream, they may or may not be oxidized. And so how do we correlate the oxidative level of blood samples, of, of plasma levels of cholesterol, uh, with uh, the true oxidation inside the plaques where they're dangerous? Somebody want to answer that one? Dr. Asbill, perhaps? I don't see why the cholesterol should get oxidized uh, as it enters the artery. As I sort of the slide there, I think is, and there are studies showing that it's exogenously oxidized. It's the cooking of the animal muscle at a high temperature under the broiler or on the grill or in the fryer fat that oxidizes the cholesterol. And yes, I, I ran across a study validating that. Um, to, if, if, how can nobody eats raw meat? I mean, we're all constantly right, eating but, all this but I, I, I know that I've read, and I don't, I can't quote the study exactly, but I've read a source that talked about cholesterol oxidizing once it's inside the plant. Yes, I've read that too. Either way, oxidized cholesterol is not something that's friendly to your arteries. It's clear right. it plays a role in the atherogenesis and lower is better, I would think. But so if we're, if we're measuring it just in the plasma, we don't really know what's going on inside the plaques. Well, if it's high in the in plasma, you can pretty much, <laughs> it's going to be higher in the plaque rate as well, most likely, that's where it's coming from. Hmm. But um this is about artery abuse uh, and the disease that we uh, inflict as the arteries respond to how we treat them, similar to uh, other organs. Their liver abuse when, when the alcoholic person uh, uh, can repeatedly injures their liver and it goes into cirrhosis. That's liver abuse. Well, atherosclerosis is artery abuse from from how we treat it. You raise a child on a whole food, plant based diet, and and for their whole adult life, they're running nothing but rice and beans and greens and fruits and veggies. Uh, cooked at low temperature through those artery walls. There's no reason they should develop atherosclerotic plaques in the walls of those arteries, no matter what their liver decides to keep in their arteries as far as uh, uh, cholesterol levels go. This is uh, artery abuse. And if we take care of our arteries, they'll take care of us. Very good. Okay, I'm seeing the hands now. Uh, Jane Dorsey. So Dr. Esselstyn's book includes examples of the um, difficult to lower cholesterol levels of good, so-called good uh, vegans, low oil, but they weren't low enough. A couple of people, it seems it's just our bodies. When we have nuts and avocados on a regular basis, 
don't get low enough. And one of the things uh, I've seen uh, is the fiber. Um, we actually do retake, re-up our own cholesterol um, in the body if we don't have enough fiber going through the gut. Um, and that fiber, uh, it, it's not just a little munch and crunch that those vegetables and cabbage and snacks of nothing but vegetables, unrefined, no drippy dressings on them, except maybe some mashed up beans or something, it can make the difference. So um, I think exercise is another, another part of the um, resistant cholesterol level. There can be runners, marathon runners who still have slightly elevated um, levels but it turns out we're still supplementing their diet with semi-refined vegan food. So that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you for that, Jane. All right, Justin Charles. Hey, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. I actually um, adopted a whole food plant-based diet after attending Dr. McDougall's program as a medical student back in 2018. So really happy to see this panel. Um, so my question is about, I think some of the non-cholesterol related cardiovascular risk factors that I've been seeing a lot of lifestyle medicine folks talk about. And so now this is in addition to following an optimal whole food plant-based diet, but things like omega-3 levels, LP little a especially, which has gotten a lot of press and does not seem to be as easily affected by diet, the role in testing for those levels and perhaps doing some additional supplementation, again, not in lieu of an optimal whole food plant-based diet, but in addition to, to maximize cardiovascular risk reduction. Just wanted to hear um, any thoughts on that. Uh Dr. Clapper, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Asbill, any thoughts? I'd be thrilled to answer that. Sure. Okay. These supplements, these supplements create serious nutritional imbalances, which increase your risk of dying of heart disease, overall risk of death, and dying of cancer. The studies are extensive. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, when they looked at just multivitamins, you know, the one a day vitamin that you take every morning with your orange juice. They estimated that for, for every million users of multivitamins, every million, there were 9,000 extra deaths. These huh. things create nutritional imbalances, which cause havoc at a cellular level. And I can't think of a supplement that, uh, well, maybe B12, that, that you don't have to, you, you should avoid. I, I just, you know, vitamin D, beta carotene, vitamin E, I mean, I, I think the record is really clear, folic acid, that these things are across havoc at a cellular level. Don't take them. Of course, that doesn't make me very popular because many of my colleagues sell supplements. Right, right. Yeah, thanks for that. Dr. Brakey, your thoughts on supplements? Um, I agree. B12, uh, I always recommend um, vitamin D for people in the um, areas where we don't get as much sun as John does. Uh, but selective, uh, it's it's uh, it's best to get it from the sun. That's how nature intended. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I just also want to comment on part of the reason for that, and Jane alluded to it, is that our microbiome helps us to bring the, uh, it, it helps produce nutrients, it helps to detoxify, uh, and fiber deficiency uh, contributes to all of this, uh, microbiome dysbiosis. Um, and, and, and chronic inflammation through gap junctions. Uh, and uh, so, so another big piece of this is people that are plant-based. Um, in many studies, uh, T. Colin Campbell showed a report that they, they looked at the American omnivores, vegetarians, and vegans, uh, their percent fat content, their number of sugar grams, and their milligrams of sodium. And they were the same. Uh, they had carried their addictions with them. Um, and similarly with fiber in many studies, even vegans are only in the 35 gram per day race, uh, which, which just meets the paltry minimum um, US dietary guidelines where optimal is more like 60 to 100 grams a day. Um, so uh, fiber, 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 it's also a marker for other good parts of whole plant foods. Um, and I think it's sometimes part of the reason for these paradoxical ones, um, people that are on a mostly processed or um, a low fiber diet that's maybe plant-based um, may still get the adverse outcomes. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Brakey. Uh, I'm going to make a quick announcement because we, we're going to take one more question from 
uh, Curtis Conrad. Uh, I just want to uh, mention that we you will be receiving a, a, an email, uh, hopefully tonight, but possibly not till tomorrow morning, that it will allow you to retrieve your one hour of CME. Uh, okay, your final, the final question, please. And then if you want, to, if anybody wants to stick around after that, we will give you a little tour of our new forum. Go ahead, Kiras. I'm working with several different physicians who insist that if you are diabetic, even if your cholesterol levels are very low, that you take a statin. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, let's see. Who haven't we heard from? We haven't heard from Dr. Asbo lately. You know, I, I, I think diabetics, well, they're, they're more likely to have disease. They're more likely to have worse outcomes if they have an event. And it's just, it goes back to the, would you treat all patients with diabetes with a statin? I would answer that question the same way I would answer, would you treat all patients with a total cholesterol over 200 with a statin? I, I just think you need to know more. How are they well controlled? Are their inflammatory markers up? Do they have vascular disease? Do they have subclinical disease? I, I tended and still would tend to treat them as I would. I wouldn't treat them any differently, frankly. I would want to know their inflammatory markers and whether they have the disease because if putting them on a statin is going to increase their risk. It's going to increase their blood sugars some. And it just um, seems like we're treating a, one disease process and, and worsening another. Yeah, so Dr. Clapper, your thoughts on that question? Yeah. And Let's just hear from Dr. Clapper, please. Yes, I absolutely agree with uh, with Brian. You have to find out what's really happening in the individual patient's arteries, and and a blanket recommendation for all diabetics seems to be inappropriate. Uh, look at the individual patient in front of you, and follow the Thank you for that. Uh, it's an thank you. Measure, a quality metric. Thank you very much. And I also am a graduate of Dr. McDougall's program, <laughs> and uh, so helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Dr. Brakey, you were uh... um, commonly that's an incentive metric uh, incented by insurance companies and put into HEDIS and other quality metrics is that all diabetics should be on a statin. So doctors get points commonly, and that may determine even some of their uh, reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, insurance companies get stars uh, based on how many of these metrics they're they're meeting, and uh, you know, again, for people on the standard American diet it probably is beneficial for uh, the majority. I wouldn't say all, but the majority of, of diabetics who are not well controlled to be on a statin, um, it, the, the outcomes may be better, but that's not the population. It's not what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the root cause of both conditions, which are not diseases, but conditions and treat them at the root cause. Uh, I'd like to add one more thing in terms of my patient care. You know, uh, I do prescribe statins and, uh, the one concern I have is that when I hand somebody a prescription for statins, that they're thinking, Dr. McDougal, if you think your diet's so darn good, why are you giving me this prescription? You know, I, I think it takes away from your message, the, the intensity of your message by prescribing drugs, particularly when it's questionable, of questionable necessity. You're, you're doing harm in your relationship. Mm -hmm. yet, yeah, I really believe that diet I recommend is that good. And that's one of the reasons I'm careful about prescribing statins only to those that my best guess is are going to benefit more than they get hurt. That's great. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Drs. McDougall and Clapper, uh, Dr. Asbill, our guest, another one of our guests, and Dr. Brakey, as always, you guys were brilliant. And uh, we're getting a lot of applause out here in the audience. Uh, for people who would like to stick around, um, Bob, uh, Frankie is going to show us, uh, give us a little demonstration of what the forums will look like. You'll have access to them in a couple of days. We're, we've been working on this for over a year, and uh, we just didn't want to release it tonight because we want it to be operating a little more optimally. There's just a, a few tiny things going on. So uh, we don't have, um, Deborah Kiali had to get off. So um, Bob, if you could just, with your uh, pointer, show people where the Lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds Forum is. So you see, this is what happens when you come onto the site. You'll see a list of groups. Um, actually, Bob, before you do that, can 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 we show what it looks like? What a what a profile looks like or not? Is that set up or not? Um, oh, it's a, it's a demo. This, this but, one this one is is fairly so, uh, bare pretty, bones pretty at this point, but okay. you know. That's 56% uh, yeah. complete, but you right. can upload your, your picture and 
uh, talk about your personal likes. Uh, there's other connections. Uh, so it's it's similar to Facebook. Right. All right. Let's go back to that other page that has the um, groups on it. And then you'll see that there's one that's labeled Lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds. So if you click on that, that will take you to uh, this larger group that will have a bunch of subgroups. And that's the way it looks like if you're doing it on the list. And this is the way it looks like if you have it on the grid. Uh, and you can see these are past grand rounds. So we've um, gone in and put in many of them. We, we still have a few of the, of the older ones to put up there. Um, but for example, if you were to click on, uh, well, how about click on the Wayne Dysinger one? Let's see. Uh, I think Deborah had done more work on uh, on Michael okay. Clapper. All right, let's see that one. That's good. Okay. okay. Um, you can see there's if we if we scroll down, um, we can you can uh, as a member of the this group you will be able to put in your own thoughts into the chat. You can ask questions. Um, there will be a video of the. Let's see how do you get to the video? There it is. Video slide there. Okay, so he's going to click on that, and um, so like getting someone to scratch your back. There we go. You got it right there. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's the, that. That's the uh, the recording of the entire event, just like you were, just like you saw. And if you scroll down some more, I think you've got uh, there's his slides, and um, uh, I believe um, yeah, there's the slides. We also download the chat so, uh, so people can review the chat if there's anything in there they want to take a look at. And I think you've also got the uh, um, uh, the closed caption. Closed captions, yeah. Let's yeah, how does that transcript. work? Yeah, the whole transcript. So um, we also set this up to be useful for our patients. We actually set this up to be initially for our uh, alumni group for people who didn't want to go on Facebook. And while we were building it, we thought, you know, this could be kind of I have a greater purpose. So um, we have uh, other groups that, that, for example, clinicians for climate change. I don't know if Bob, you want to click on the nature photography. So, you know, one of the ways we're going to end up help, help to save this planet is people have to learn to love the planet. And um, not that most of us don't, right? But um, yeah, so the, I've started my own uh, album on here and we're going to invite other photographers to have albums. So if you click on Dr. Veggie's nature photos, uh, this is just an example of um, some of my photographs. And if you click on that, you can um, scroll through those. And um, so if you're interested in uh, participating with your incredible photographs, I mean, there's so many great photographers out there. I just can't wait to see what we get in there. Today we're uh, promoting human and planetary health through plant-based nutrition, kindness, and mutual respect, a program of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Uh, and as I said earlier, for um, you know, we're facing this climate change disaster a lot faster than uh, some people were expecting. Um, I think many people on the screen are surprised it didn't happen sooner. Uh, but anyway, um, if you scroll down, you'll see why we call it one pale blue dot. Uh, there's a, actually a photograph. Uh, the, the, keep going. The NASA photograph um, that or, or, that little tiny dot. That's Earth taken uh, by a Voyager. One uh, in 19, February 1990, at the suggestion of um, Carl Sagan, and who actually coined the phrase uh, uh, "pale blue dot." And um, so, lots to talk about here. I don't want to. Um, I, I don't want to keep people up any later than necessary. But if you just, yeah. So that's great. Uh, you're going to get an invitation in a couple of days, along with the uh, uh, the link to the um, video you'll to, to, of this event to see the. Uh, uh, video of this event, you will need to join. It's three months free. And then it's going to be the incredibly expensive charge of $5 a month uh, to just to, um, that was a joke, um, just to help maintain the platform uh, because we don't want to have advertising and, or any biases uh, based on commercial interests. So um, we're hoping that that will be uh, enough to keep this little, uh, this thing afloat because we do have, uh, we do pay our employees, although I'm a full-time volunteer. So anyway, uh, anybody have any questions or thoughts about that before we say goodnight? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, listen, thank you all for your patience and your brilliance. And um, let's, uh, if you don't, um, if we don't see you sooner, we'll see you next month uh, at our next Lifestyle Medicine Grand Rounds. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Great presentation, Dr. Clapper. All right. Thank you all.
so much. Thank you all.